Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, if you're here with Zoom or on Facebook, um, or you're watching Channel 9 on CCTV, I want to thank you for being here with us today. Um, here we are, over a month of sheltering in place. Um, I want to say good job to, to a lot of you. Most of us are really doing our part here. We're listening to the public health officials who are telling us, keep it at the minimum six feet apart from other people. We're now wearing masks um, and we are really playing our role and doing our part to not contribute to that medical surge that our hospital and hospitals across Massachusetts have um, been experiencing. Um, and to those of you who have also now lost somebody that you love dearly and someone that you know to, um, to this virus, I wanna say, I am really sorry. This is really hard. And um, together we are trying to figure out how to keep each other safe, keep our, our loved ones safe. And uh, while we're trying to make sure that our hospitals can continue providing care for all of us, those of us who have COVID and, and people who don't have COVID, we also have a tremendous group of people across this country and across the state and really across our community here in Cambridge who have stepped up, who've always stepped up to work to meet the needs of so many in our neighborhoods, um, but who've really been called to step up in a way that I don't know that we could have imagined was possible uh, six or seven weeks ago. And um, at these moments when it feels the hardest and it's the most painful, it becomes the most important time that we lean on each other. Um, we, are n we are in this together. Whether we like it or not, we are in this together. And the good news is today, I am joined by people who um, most of their lives have chosen to be in this together through their work. And so I'm going to just introduce them um, very briefly, but I'm gonna ask them very quickly to say a little bit about themselves. And then we're gonna talk about the work that each of you are doing. Um, and, and how we as a community and anybody who's watching this can really help support the work that you're doing and more importantly, support, uh, support people because that's what each of you are doing. You each are stepping up to make sure that people in need right now in our neighborhoods are getting what they need. Um, so I'm gonna start with, um, you know, I'd say all of you are like my favorite people, but I have to say that I've known this person who is um, who's our mayor. I've known her since she was in high school and I was on the city council. I watched her really rise as a, a young leader who clearly had a purpose and a destination for helping others from, from the moment that I met her. Um, that has not stopped um, from becoming a legal services attorney to now the mayor of Cambridge, Massachusetts. I wanna say thank you, Mayor Sumbal Siddiqui for everything you are doing for your leadership, for your commitment, and for the work that you have been doing, particularly around the Mayor's Relief Fund. Um, if you could just maybe say a little bit about yourself and then we'll, we'll move through the others and we'll come back to some questions. Sure, so I wanna just start off by saying thank you to you, um, Rep. Decker. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I always say you can't be what you can't see and uh, you've helped me see uh, what, you know, leadership is and um, your support during this time and your guidance, um, you know, and your partnership has just been critical. So. Uh, I really, really appreciate that. And I wanna thank um, the, the rest of the panelists for the tremendous work that you're doing uh, every day. Uh, it is making such a huge impact uh, for residents. And so from the bottom of my heart, uh, really thank you to, to you and your staff. Um, it's, it's tremendous. Uh, you know, I have been seeing the last seven weeks uh, just how, uh, amazing this community is. Uh, it's my hometown, so I, and uh, Rep. Decker's hometown as well, and we know how amazing it is, and definitely during times of crisis, it's very clear. So the fund, uh, you know, we've been able to raise uh, about $3.6 million to date, uh, and that is really out of uh, the support from the residents. Uh, over 1,000 residents have donated, um, and we've had some major uh, corporate sponsors uh, everything from Takeda um, to uh, MIT to uh, many others who've just stepped up and said, look, we want to help. Uh, and so a lot of the, the work that we've been doing a lot around the Mayor's Fund, I'm very, very proud of. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of need, right? And I think um, I'm happy to get into uh, a little bit more about eligibility later um, and specific questions about the fund. Um, but we've been able to so far help about 366 
uh, individuals and families uh, with uh, their rental payments and uh, their household expenses. Uh, but those applications are growing. Uh, we have a team of about 50 folks working and taking calls and actually the applications went live April 13th. And it feels like three years ago, but it was actually just two weeks ago. So we're really working hard um, and we've uh, donated, uh, distributed nearly half a million uh, dollars so far. And uh, we'll be seeing more of that money go up uh, later this week. So, you know, we're continuing our fundraising efforts. Uh, we really want to thank the community that, on behalf of myself, the vice mayor, um, Alana Mallon, and the city council. Uh, we really are uh, trying to reach as many residents as possible. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor. Thank you for all you're doing. Um, our next guest is um, Dr. Natalicia Tracy, Executive Director of the Brazilian Worker Center and Brazilian Policy Center. And um, you have been an incredible voice and a presence on Beacon Hill for as long as I've been there. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I know you can't share them today, but you shared some pretty powerful photos that I think have moved a lot of people. And it really shows that while we think we know the pain that people are experiencing, um, I don't think many people um, who might be watching this, I hope I'm wrong, but are, ex are seeing it from the point of view um, where you are. We have a lot of people in our community who are immigrants and who are not able to access traditional resources and services. And every day you're, you're literally feeling their pain and, and trying to meet their needs. So if you could talk just a little bit about sort of what it looks like from your point of view and, and the work that the center does. Oh, wait, you're mute. Oh, you've got to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here with all of you and share a little bit of what we're seeing and hearing in our community. Uh, the Brazilian Workers Center, we have been here for 25 years and our mission has always to be to organize, advocate for social, economic and political justice. Um, usually we serve about 5,000 people uh, per year and another 15,000 doing education and training. But right now we actually seeing those numbers almost daily, right? So we just finished a food distribution right now and we served 3,000 people, families, just between 12 noon and now. Um, it, is, um, it is a little bit stressful to say the least because we are trying to, you know, obey the social distancing order but that is not really possible in situation that you have people who are hungry, who need diapers, who haven't worked for going on six weeks, and they didn't have any economic security or safety net before this, prior to this, to turn to. So that's what we're seeing, we he hearing from a lot of members of the community in relation to having to take public transportation who are crowded, who are not being sanitized, or having to take uh, vans or, or having to ride with, with uh, someone carpooling under the circumstances. And those are biggest concern right now is food security and people's safety as well, because we feel like if we're going to be able to end this pandemic and we have to work together and everyone needs to be part of the, the solution, have to be inclusive effort. Thank you, Dr. Tracy. Um, and next, I'd like to introduce Sasha Papora, who is the executive director for Food for Free, who I just have to say has been um, Thank you. Thank you, Rep Decker. You also have been shining a light on the work that we're doing and on the work that everybody's doing. And uh, this has been an incredibly challenging seven weeks for us, but it's equaled, it doesn't take away, but it's really equaled by what we've seen in terms of the support of the community and of the city and of you, Rep Decker, and of our volunteers. We have, so about seven weeks ago, since we're in our seventh week of a program we kicked into gear as soon as we determined that the schools were closing and our, our food rescue work is ongoing and we're delivering, picking up food at stores and bringing it to other cities and serving Somerville, but within Cambridge, we started a program that we thought would be a quick stop gap, you know, let's just deal with now. And it's a, a home delivery program. So every day our trucks go to the Greater Boston Food Bank who have been absolutely tremendous partners to us and pick up between eight and 12,000 pounds of food, bring it to the senior center, which the city has lent to us during this time. 
And each day we have between 65 and 80 volunteers come through safely and with distance. And we pack up 350 plus arps, twice that, about 700 plus bags to deliver to households. So last week we delivered 1900 to 1,928 households. Each of them got two bags. And so the program has been growing and growing and uh, you know, it started to serve school families and then the food pantries were closing. So we had to capture that audience and then everything closed and the need has grown. Um, so we are trying to scale our program and we have been able to do it. I, I hate seeing the pressure my staff are under, but they are 100% behind this as, as we all are. We have started a few new initiatives to try to make sure we can over the long term make sure that everybody in Cambridge that needs access to food gets it. So we will be taking, looking at um, how close our, our, our clients are to Market Basket and we're gonna be moving 400 households, people who are not seniors or ill or disabled, people that can leave the house. And between May and June, through May and June, we'll be sending them $30 gift cards every week rather than doing the home delivery. And that's to ensure that if people can't, you know, and more people, more and more seniors are signing up, um, people are, are contracting COVID or have other issues and can't leave their homes. At the same time, uh, our, our staff member and, and Vice Mayor Alana Mallon has been working with our partners, the Cambridge Economic Opportunity Committee to call every household on our list to help see are they qualified for SNAP and enroll them if they are and they aren't already enrolled and inform them of the additional benefits available. We have um, other, uh, other people in the community like Darren at the Cambridge Community Center that have opened up a new food pantry because the need is, 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 is beyond anything we've ever seen and we really need all hands on deck. We need volunteers, we need other food pantries, we need the city's support, we're getting all of that, but the need just continues to grow. Thank you, Sasha. You guys have literally been a lifeline for so many people in this community, um, and it's so obvious. And I just, my gratitude for you, for every, all the staff at Food for Free and all of the volunteers. Um, and, and then we have um, Lynn Margerio, who's the executive director of um, Cradles to Crayons, who's also a Cambridge resident, but really they serve the entire state. And um, Lynn, it, it's, it's, it's great to see you. Um, and I want to thank you for the incredible work. We, you quickly pivoted when we asked you to help us meet the needs of, of families like diapers. And um, as usual, um, that's who you are. It's who I know you to be as somebody who quickly pivoted and started figuring out how we can meet the needs of families um, with young children and babies. And so if you could just tell us a little bit more about what it looks like from your point of view, what's changed and what are the needs and um, what are you seeing yeah. Uh, so thank you so much, Representative Decker, for um, uh, you know, for having this panel today. It's such an important uh, issue that the um, city of Cambridge, but you know, uh, the whole country is facing now with this incredible demand for basic needs, for survival needs. Um, it's nothing like anything I've experienced in the 18 years of running Cradles to Crayons. Um, in a kind of typical um, world, we would be providing clothing and books and school supplies, and we'd be, do, we'd be doing that in our giving factory warehouse, um, really fueled by um, donations of clothing and, uh, and volunteers who um, would be helping us to pick and pack and, um, and uh, all of those items to the level of an individual child. Um, we're a little bit different than um, what we've just been hearing um, from uh, Sasha and from Dr. Tracy about how they're serving the community. We serve the community by partnering with other organizations. And during this period, um, the very first thing we did was to reach out to our partners, the social service agencies, the schools, um, uh, community health centers, our hospital partners to find out what is it that um, they need, how are they pivoting to serve this demand, and the top request we heard from uh, our partner agencies was for diapers, uh, close second for uh, diaper wipes and hygiene items, and so we shifted our focus away from 
those other basic needs that we provide on a year round basis to trying to figure out how can we be a uh, resource for diapers um, and for hygiene items and now school um, school and activity supplies for kids who are um, learning at home. And what we typically would be providing, just uh, we looked last year in the month of April, our demand was for about um, 62,500 diapers. The demand for this April is closer to 750,000 diapers. And, um, and that's just what we see. So there are um, you know, other sources that, um, that people might be tapping for diapers, but it just, you know, this more than tenfold increase in the demand that we see is, uh, is incredible. We are also experiencing some challenges with um, just securing our supply timely. There are issues, you see them um, in the stores now where the shelves for these items are just bare. So um, we have been really working hard to secure a reliable resource, you know, reliable sources. We've had to go to non-traditional sources to um, to secure that uh, those diapers. And um, we expect to be getting shipments. We just got a shipment in recently and we'll be getting another one in this week. So we're excited to be able to get back out there and refill um, the, the shelves um, at the shelters that, uh, that we are seeing now at, um, at Cambridge um, City Hall. We're partnering with Food for Free um, and uh, with other Cambridge-based agencies with our hospitals and with other um, social service agencies across the state. Thank you, Lynn. That's a staggering number. Um, and the ability that you and your organization have had to be able to pivot to quickly figure out how to secure additional resources um, and, and to change the model of how you access those resources and how you distribute them. Um, Mayor Siddiqui, one of the questions, this is not directly related to the relief fund, but it's up here, so I want to make sure we answer it. It's what is the current mask policy in Cambridge? Um, I know it, but I, I, I'd love for you to share it since someone is really wanting to get a more clarity on this. So we're giving um, about a week for um, enforcement on uh, the mask policy. And, you know, I want to just start off the bat saying, you know, this is something that's been challenging, right? There's folks who have been very, very passionate about this uh, topic. There's folks who, uh, you know, are getting into, you know, a lot of arguments about um, this topic. And I think one thing I just want to bring home in uh, is that we really are focused on educating uh, the public about um, wearing uh, face coverings because right now, you know, we, we there are some challenges, right, with social distancing. We know that, um, you know, if you're asymptomatic, you may not know you uh, are a carrier. Uh, so it is about um, thinking about um, those aspects. And I think there's been a lot of concerns also about the po police enforcement. And off the bat, I want to say we are going to come up with, um, you'll hear this shortly, but it will be concentrating on education and our Cambridge Police Department will be handing out masks. So uh, this order, you know, applies to anyone over the age of five years old with the exceptions. Um, there's, our, there's some exceptions listed in um, the guidelines provided by the CDC. Uh, you know, it says violations may be punishable by $300 fine. I want to make it clear that that our first intent is to really make sure that people have the supply. Uh, and that's why, you know, in a few days we'll be releasing where you can pick up masks. All the cruisers are going to have, be carrying around supplies to give out masks. So those details, you know, we didn't have ready to go, but we wanna, um, that will be informed by our policy. So, you know, public places, sidewalks, streets, uh, parks, plazas, bus stops, uh, you know, there's all these areas that the public is out. And if you are near near folks, um, and we have, it, it, you know, we don't have these wide, wide streets, um, you know, we want to make sure that folks are properly uh, 
social distancing. And a really key part of this uh, order is also if you're inside um, a, a business um, and uh, you're working inside a business, um, you know, you have to be wearing um, a face covering. Uh, so yeah. we've done a lot of work around making sure our stores have these supplies uh, and that employees, um, you know, have uh, are wearing these coverings. And when you're going inside, you know, cashiers also need to be protected, right? You know, as someone whose mom is a cashier at a star market, I told she's not working right now, um, but she was for a few weeks and no one, yeah, she, I, I begged her not to go, uh, but she was like, I love my customers. I have to go, but no one was, you know, is wearing masks. No one's right. wearing, um, so this, this will apply uh, this order. The businesses are covered uh, under that. So that includes the grocery stores, the laundry mats, right. the dry cleaners and so forth. So, uh, you know, happy to say more, but we will be really focusing on getting the supplies to folks and um, versus the, the punishment. Great, thank you. Um, and I, I just know that that was a question that's up there. So I think that the takeaways for me are, they are, they're not a recommendation, they're a requirement. I think also we should remind people that the city is not looking for citizens to police each other or bother yes. each other. That is really the job of the police department and the public health department. And our police department is not looking to try to shame people, but rather to assist them in, in getting access to uh, face coverings. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna just remind people who are watching this, you are welcome to go into the Q&A box and type your questions as well. So we have questions that were sent ahead of time, um, but also for those who are watching and would like to type their questions in, please do. Um, Dr. Tracy, can you just tell us more about what keeps, what keeps you awake at night when you think about the calls that you're getting? Um, and I have a story that you told me that was very poignant, but where, where, where do we need to, where are we failing? as a society, as a state, as a community, and what are some of the solutions that you think we need to be acting on now and how can people support um, your organization and organizations like yours? Yeah, I, I'm i gonna say that, uh, you know, what keeping me up at night, it's like those moms actually asking for diapers. We have had an unbelievable number of requests for diapers. I'm buying diapers everywhere that I can get my hands on them. Uh, there are a lot of moms with newborns, like one month, two months old, and a lot of them actually are single mom for the reason that their husbands have been deported. That's what I'm learning. That's why they're actually giving birth here on their own. Uh, so, and also we're dealing with the domestic violence issues as well. We've seen a, a huge increase in that in the community because of the level of stress and everyone at home. So we are trying to figure out our best to deal with that. And I think the what really stresses me out in addition to this is to try to figure out a solution for the public health crisis that we have right now that is inclusive because every time I am working with a family and, and not having, like you just, um, Mayors, um, you know, you're just talking about um, uh, Zumbi, you're just talking about people wearing masks and all of that. And we're just outside now, everyone wearing masks on my team and gloves. And uh, but then we have this this huge line, right, with, with hundreds of people and with children and babies and elderly. And they are not wearing those those gears. Right. So no, no protective. Uh, uh, personal protective equipment. So that's really important to think about long term. How are we going to get out of this pandemic and this crisis if we're not inclusive in, in making sure that those resources are uh, actually getting to those families as well who are part of the Commonwealth, like it or not, we're all here and in all this together and we need to think out of a solution out of this together. So, so that's my concern. Biggest concern right now is access to healthcare access to, to food and diapers and access to inform, continue to get access to information to many families uh, to ensure that they have adequate you know access to basic needs especially testing as well uh, it, it's it's crucial I think where we are right now I think um, before I, I have a question up here for Sasha but I think one of the poignant moments I had in a conversation with you yesterday was you were on the phone with a mom who was in distress right so she was calling you and the things that she was in distress about weren't the things that you were listening to her say to her child right so at one point she says to her child 
don't drink your brother's milk. And you had to ask her, do you need milk? And I think one of the things that we're concerned about is people have so many needs that the stuff that they're asked, if their needs are so great mm -hmm. and so unmet, the things that they're asking for don't include basic things that they need. Like you had to say, I can get you milk. That's right. And so we need to make sure that all of their needs are getting met so that they can, so they can feed their children and feed themselves. That's right. And once we hear, don't drink your brother's milk, you think it's a 15 year old, maybe older child, right? But she's telling this to a five year old not to drink the two year old milk. So it is hard to hear that and to get people to talk about the basic needs and what are the priorities right now, especially when it comes to their children. Thank you. Uh, Sasha, people are asking if they have non-perishable food items, is it, is, uh, is it okay for them to approach, safely approach the senior center or another location that they can bring food? Are you accepting perishable and non-perishable items? Not at the senior center, but my guess is that uh, the food pantries that are open, so currently the Cambridge Community Center is actively um, providing a food pantry, the Margaret Fuller House and East End House. The reason it makes more sense to bring some of those to the food pantries are um, they have their, as it is, they're getting rescued food and they can mix and match things. At the senior center, we're keeping everything the same. So if we're going to have a can of beans, we need 2,000 cans of beans. Right. Thank you. Um, another question we are asking is, uh, I'll pivot over to, uh, to, to Lynn. Can you tell us um, how are people finding you? Um, you know, if a mom doesn't know where to go for diapers or for other uh, basic needs that you're able to pr provide. How are people finding you and where should they find you? Yep. So um, we are a kind of a, a resource to other agencies. And so people are finding us. Um, we have, we have, uh, our phones have been really ringing off the hook with our traditional partners. We have about 145 social service agency partners who we provide clothing and books and school supplies and other items to year round for the families that they serve. Um, we are also hearing from agencies that have not traditionally reached out to us um, in the past. And so right now we're really trying to look at how, um, how to prioritize among the requests that we are getting. When we get a request from a, um, a family directly, what we do is look to refer them to um, an agency, um, a social worker or a case manager in their neighborhood who can um, be a resource for them for other needs as well. Likely if they need diapers, they may need food, they may need shelter, they may need some other, um, other types of assistance. And so we look to first connect them with someone um, who is a trusted agency in their, um, in their neighborhood. So, um, so that's how we are continuing to, um, to operate. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about or react to what Dr. Tracy shared just about um, her concerns about kids. Uh, you know, newborns, families who are delivering, uh, you know, newborns, they, they, in good times, many of them do not have the basic supplies and stock of diapers or um, clothing, um, other items that, you know, are really essential to a newborn safety. And, and now we're seeing that, um, you know, that is, that continues to be the case, but there are many, many additional people who may have never experienced need before who are finding themselves in a situation where um, they don't know where to go to, uh, to ask for that help and, um, and their need is, uh, is critical. So, so that is something that, um, that we're certainly very focused on. We're also very focused on the fact that this is not a sprint. This is unfortunately going to be a marathon. Um, and so while, you know, for, for an organization like ours who focuses on um, providing um, basic needs for children, we are looking at, okay, today the top needs are diapers and, uh, and hygiene items. 
but we know that clothing requests are also going to be coming up as the season, you know, as it gets warmer outside, kids don't stop growing in a pandemic. Um, and so we are having to think about how do we shift our model so that we can provide clothing into, you know, to the community, how are we getting it out there? Um, knowing that so many of the partners that we've traditionally worked with are um, now focused on um, being food pantries or providing some of these other emergency services. So your point about just the needs being great um, and them being, um, you know, plenty of uh, just covering a lot of different um, products. That's something that I think we're all going to need to try to figure out. How can we as a sector um, respond to what is unprecedented demand that will be with us for weeks, you know, potentially months to come? Definitely months. Um, Madam Mayor, there's two questions I have for you. Um, one, people are asking who qualifies for the city's disaster relief fund. And to that extent, I would say one of the things that's really important about this fund is that it gives people access to cash. And as Dr. Tracy and in, in her conversation with his mom, the needs are so great that often people um, still will not feel comfortable enough telling people all of their needs. They'll feel like they have to actually choose which needs that they can ask for because of a sense of pride or a sense of shame. Um, and um, it becomes more important that people have access to cash so that they can also have some agency in helping to meet some of those needs of their families without having to put everything that they need onto someone else. So please tell us more about um, how one qualifies for the Mayor's Relief Fund and um, is there any sort of pattern to who you're seeing or what people are asking, the, what reasons that they're giving you for the money that they need? Sure, so um, we'll be highlighting some stories uh, in the next Week or, week or two of folks who've uh, been uh, recipients and uh, you know what they're saying uh, because those are very powerful. So as far as the eligibility goes, you have to be a Cambridge resident. Um, the second point is you have to either be a tenant or um, an owner uh, of a home purchased through the uh, city's uh, housing affordable housing uh, uh, program. The the third piece is that you have to at the time um, of you have at the time of the loss, um, you have to be at 100% of you prior to the COVID-19 loss, you have to be at 100% of the area median income. So that's third. And then you have to actually show a loss um, as a result of COVID-19 and the crisis. So those are the four criteria that, that we're looking at. And so we have an application process. Uh, oh, and I wanna make it clear that um, you do not need a social security number um, to apply to the funds. Uh, so immigration status is not considered um, at all uh, when, you're, when you're applying. So I wanna just make that clear. Uh, so, you know, what we're seeing is that it is a lot of folks who are, um, you know, looking for rental assistance. Uh, they uh, have lost their jobs. Um, we have folks who are in the service industry. We have folks who um, drive Uber, um, you know, folks who um, can't work for whatever reason um, because they, uh, you know, may have a family member that they take care of um, and who, you know, they can't go to work because they have to, uh, they don't want to bring the disease home, right? So there's all these different um, things we're seeing. Uh, and, you know, as, as Lynn earlier said, there is a huge need for household items, right? Um, uh, divers included, uh, you know, food, uh, utility payments, um, you name it. So we want to really be able to plug in those gaps um, as best as we can. Uh, and so, you know, yes, maybe um, these individuals may be getting unemployment, they may be getting other funds that they're applying to. We're not looking at any of that. Is it Really, if you look at how far this will extend, um, any help um, that we can give is really, really important. But there are caps um, right now. Um, no individual can get more than four thousand um, dollars, and so you know that that's not a huge, huge amount, probably in the grand scheme of things. But um, you know, it is something that we um, we, we want to make sure that what we are providing is at least um, somewhat um, uh, substantive and fits the folks. 
um, and their needs. And so, uh, we, you know, we had only planned originally to do one month rent, um, but we are going to be doing two months rent. Um, and I think there's a plan really to think about three months and four months and make sure the city, um, if we are gonna be depleting these funds, make sure the city steps in as well if, if we need them to. Um, but really, it, it, it's those really basic, basic needs. And so uh, that's why the fund is really important because we can get that money out um, twice a week at this point um, to the families who need it the most. So if people contribute, if they want to actually donate to the mayor's fund, how do they do that? So we have a website, um, you know, cambridgema.gov slash COVID-19 slash MDRF. So uh, that's a simple link. And is it set up so that people could give like automatically like $10 a month or $20 a month if they want it? Or is it a one-time contribution they have to make? So right now, I think it's just a, it's a one-time contribution, but, you know, we, we're probably going to explore different ways of, you know, if you want to have it um, reoccur uh, as well. And you can also pay by check and mail it to uh, the, the 795 Mass Ave. So people who give to the Mayor's Relief Fund in Cambridge at least should know that one of the important things it does is that it's unrestricted. It allows families to decide what the priority of needs that they are. It gives them that sense of still control at a time when, when so many of us have lost all control. Um, and it allows them to still have some privacy if they choose to figure out what their needs are without having to talk about everything that they need. While many of those same families will be reaching out to other organizations for support as well. So um, I do want to thank everyone who's given to it and I encourage more people. This is, as uh, I think Lynn said, this is it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. But I've been telling people that it, it's probably more like an ultra marathon. And for people who are the most vulnerable, it's, it's, it's a few marathons. Um, the way we open up is going to take stages and the most vulnerable, um, the, if we don't work to support them today, it's going to last longer. Um, I, I would ask Dr. Tracy, um, could you tell us a little bit about, more about, um, I, I have a question for all of you, um, but and I'll start with you. One is that what, is, what are the ways people can support the Brazilian Workers Center right now? What is the most important thing that they can do to support you? And what does that support allow your staff to do? Um, well, thank you for asking that. So right now, what we're asking out of the community is to donate um, food, non-perishable, because a lot of the families that we are serving, they cook their own meals at home for themselves and their children. So we are doing our best to, to give like essentials, but also be able to give some vegetables, giving some fruit as well because of the children. Um, diapers, if you can donate diapers, uh, uh, it's, you know, be greatly appreciated. Um, and, and masks, people are donating masks and also, uh, you know, um, personal, um, personal, um, equipment because protection, personal protection, protective equipment, because we get a lot of volunteers helping us to pack food, like, for example, we pack 3,000, you know, grocery bags today. And we want to make sure that we are able to provide for everyone. But also, as we see moms coming in with their children without masks, we want to be able to give them, you know, out some as well to say, you know, talk to them about the importance of wearing masks in public and, and educate them. Because we we had to repurpose our work and shift to, to, you know, to deal with the crisis. But we're not missing the opportunity to tell the community also using this as an educational tool to talk to them about, you know, tenants' rights, talking to them about uh, workers' rights, and also the U.S. Census, because, you know, we're talking to them how important it is to be counted more than ever now. And so we actually putting a postcard inside and letting them know they can call us back if they need help to, to do that as well. So, you know, we're always trying to pack things in as much as possible but that's the best way you can support us now we also have a link for donations if you decide you want to donate cash so we can go to the store and buy those products as well um it'll, it'll be great we'll make that information available as well and um to everybody um can you just tell us quickly who you serve what parts of the state and or cities that you serve so uh right now we 
we are a statewide organization. In fact, we have an office in Bridgeport, Connecticut as well. Uh, but right now we are serving the main cities we see now coming here every week. Uh, it's Boston and greater area of Boston's so all sections of Boston is Boston, especially we've seen a lot of people from Roxbury is Boston, a uh, high park Rosendale, and then we move out of side Boston area to go into Revere, Everett, uh, Chelsea, few people from Cambridge, not a lot from Cambridge, but also what um, Watertown, Waltham, Framingham moving all the way west into Worcester and some of the towns coming all the way down Worcester and Low and, and Cape Cod as well. So it, it's it's coming from everywhere because a lot of those cities, they don't have the resources, uh, access to food that they need right now. So so they cut pulling and coming over for to get groceries. Um, Thank you. I mean, thank you. This is, um, it's overwhelming. And I, I think, again, um, in the times of, of a crisis like this, we, we, we are forced to look to each other to figure out together how we're going to move through this. But I, I see what all of you are doing. And, and really, that is my hope, that there are people like you and so many people like you who are determined to make sure that while we figure out how to get through this, that those who are um, in the most pain and the most under-resourced are not being left behind and not an afterthought. Um, Sasha, I have a question for you and then I'd, I'd like to hear from anybody else. Um, one, people can continue to give to Food for Free. So, you know, we, we, we always amplify Food for Free as well as the Greater Boston Food Bank, um, at least here in Boston. Um, and in addition to that, how, how, how is your staff doing? You know, I chair the Committee on Mental Health and Substance Use and Recovery, and I've been very focused on the issues around mental health. And we talk a lot about the mental health of those frontline workers. And I think often we think about those in the hospitals who absolutely are being traumatized. But I also think about those who are working in grocery stores. And I think about those who are um, actually delivering the services right now, essential life-saving services. Um, like Dr. Tracy, yourself. Tell, tell me how your staff is doing. So that, that's been my biggest concern and stress through this. And I, I don't want to downplay at all how, how hard they are working and they and myself, the, sort of the pressure we're feeling because what we're doing is feeding people. And if it's the end of an incredibly chaotic long day and you get a call saying this family still needs food and it's Friday, we, we have to get that food to them. But I also want to say, and my staff and I have talked about this so many times, we are so lucky, um, unlike necessarily folks in the hospitals um, or even in the supermarkets, we are surrounded by 65 to 80 volunteers coming in each day and thanking us for the opportunity to get out of their houses and do something meaningful. And that is so important to them. And we feel so good about what we're able to do. So without a doubt, the pressure is so difficult, but this, my team has come together and the, the, the appreciation, the circular appreciation that is flowing is, uh, it's like food itself. It's like nutrition and they are getting a lot of that. We are doing everything we can constantly, daily, weekly to figure out how to evolve things so that while they're getting all that appreciation, they're not, they don't just collapse of, of exhaustion. And the city's stepping up and food pantries are stepping up and the COC is so many, the food bank, there are lots of folks coming in to enable that. Uh, but it's a constant effort because every time we come up with a new solution, the need grows that much more. Um, so I really appreciate Dr. Decker, that you're thinking about those things and asking those things. And my staff would be incredibly grateful because people, the, the appreciation makes it makes it that much more doable. Uh, but they are, they, are, they are full of meaning right now and they talk about that and they feel very lucky to be able to do something at this time when, when people wanna do something. And, and again, thank you. Thank you to all of your staff and the volunteers um, and our thank you will continue to translate and support. Um, I, I think at this time it's important. One of the most important things I think I learned from my parents, for those who know me, know that I grew up in public housing, I grew up in poverty. And one of the things that I always marveled at with my parents, and they really were an inspiration, um, 
we would be struggling for food. You know, and I know my mom's watching this and mom, I love you. I know you're probably crying. Um, but you know, we, there were times we had to borrow food from neighbors and, and we relied on food for free as kids. Um, but my mom and dad always had something to share. Whatever we had, they shared, right? And so I've always been inspired that those who have the least tend to give the most proportionately. I, I just believe that's true. And um, we're also at a time in which when people can give, it actually is giving them a sense of purpose to get through this, um, whether that's coming in as a volunteering or, or contributing money. So whatever you can give to Cradles to Crayon, to the Brazilian Worker Center, to, to the Food Bank and Food for Free and the Mayor's Fund, know that like if all you can do is write a check, that is, that is so phenomenal and so important. If you can't write a check and you are safely able to volunteer or make a call and check on someone, that is extraordinary. Like there's, there's nothing too great or too small. Um, Lynn, could you talk to us? One of the questions I have is, is Cambridge partnering with other communities that have been hit by the impact like Chelsea? I think that this is a recognition that for people who are doing well right now in Cambridge, the concern that we have neighboring communities, whether that's in Boston or in Chelsea, who've been disproportionately hit by this. Um, and we know that this, the disproportion has been um, largely on, although it's none of us are immune to this, some of us have more opportunity to keep distance and stay safe at, the, at, the, at this time. And so disproportionately, um, low-income communities and immigrant communities have been hit harder and sicker. And so could you talk to me a little bit more about what, um, what Cradles to Crayons does and who you serve? So we serve, um, you know, children and families in Cambridge, but also across the state, and um, and that's been how we have uh, how, how we have always functioned. So at this moment, we are getting requests again from um, from communities across the Commonwealth. We are partnering um, with. Uh, Boston Medical Center. Um, we're partnering with other hospitals who are, um, you know, in finding and, and, and um, fielding requests from families in need. And, uh, and really, um, it's, a, you know, it is across the board that we are seeing it. But to your point, the communities that have historically been underserved continue to be underserved. Hope you can't hear my, uh, I think my neighbor has, uh, has some lawn work going on, <laughs> yard work going on right now. Um, but they are disproportionately served. So for our community, uh, for our Cambridge neighbors who are able to support Cambridge residents, but who are also able to um, reach beyond, support organizations like I know um, the Cambridge Mutual Aid uh, Society is, is supporting families and individuals in Chelsea. You know, it is our opportunity to give back and be there for our neighbors wherever they live. Um, so you started this, uh, this uh, town hall by saying that we'll get through this by being in this together. And that, uh, I, I truly believe that. Thank you. Um, I also want to just add that um, we, we, for a variety of reasons, we weren't able to get it together, but um, Senator Sally Domenico, who is from Cambridge and who also represents parts of Cambridge and Chelsea, and my colleague, Danny Ryan, who um, represents Chelsea and Charlestown, I've been in touch with both of them. And for those who also want to contribute to our neighbors in Chelsea, I know that there's been a food drive through the, the Cambridge um, Aid Network, but also there's the Cambridge, there's the Chelsea One Fund, um, which is a fund that I think is trying to help in the most collaborative way, I'm told, to make sure that all organizations are benefiting from that in Chelsea. But for those who, um, who want to know more about it, um, they certainly can reach out to me or directly to Senator D. Domenico, who has been working really hard to raise money for the Chelsea One Fund as well. Um, mm -hmm. Mayor Siddiqui, one of the questions that has come up is, um, how are we working to support our homeless uh, uh, how are we working? And, and I hate saying this, homeless people, because nobody nobody is defined by where they are, their temporary status of need in life. People who are finding themselves not housed and who are temporarily um, in, in need of, of housing. What are we doing to support them? Um, and I guess I would ask both whether or not the fund is uh, available to people who don't have permanent residency or homes, and um, what else is the city doing to ensure that um, 
that the most vulnerable in our community who are under um, under housed or not housed are being cared for. Well, that's a great question, and uh, this is something that the whole council has been, uh, you know, very uh, we've been worried about the situation with our children uh, community, um, and really, you know, figuring out how the city can best help. Uh, and so we, um, in conjunction with the city manager early on, uh, look, had to look for a site for an emergency shelter. Um, and, you know, Rep. Decker, you were, in, were involved in these conversations. Uh, and this task force looked at, you know, about, I think, 17 sites. And the War Memorial was chosen for um, a few reasons, but, you know, close proximity to um, healthcare uh, facilities, um, and it can house a big uh, a large number of our um, unsheltered residents. Uh, and, you know, we also within the these last few weeks have realized, um, you know, there's a lot of things that I think six weeks ago we wanted and we didn't have access to, right? We didn't have, we didn't know that we could test um, uh, unsheltered residents, right? And so even that has changed um, how we've been able to look at this issue. And so now um, we've been able to test um, homeless um, individuals as well um, before they go into the war uh, memorial shelter. <laughs> One second, Louis is coming in. So let me just tell him I'm on a town, I'm on a town hall. That's but. our city manager. City manager. You can make an appearance. He, has he, should, he, should, he should Zoom bomb you so yeah, we can all say hello and thank you. <laughs> there he is. I apologize. <laughs> I love that he's wearing his mask, though, his face covering. Good oh, job. Yeah. So we're actually fresh legs on the mask. So oh, far. okay. I think it's good. Oh, it's not strong enough. Okay, well, we'll see. Well, it never ends. Come right down, Louis. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, you know, we were we work really closely together. Uh, so. Uh, as I was saying, I think you know we have shelters that that are open. Um, but um, one thing that we also did off the bat was make sure that we were partnering with our local businesses to provide meals um, to to these shelters. Um, and so that's something early on that um, we were able to do and we're going to continue to do. Um, and uh, we also know that what's happening at the shelter right now is at the War Memorial itself is that we, you know, want to make sure there's some people we want to make sure people are getting tested before they um, go into the, the day shelter um, in the field house itself. Uh, and so there's capacity there. So right now we're working on ways um, to make sure that we're moving folks in from Albany Street, from the Salvation Army, um, from other areas where they're not housed in Cambridge to move into the um, shelter. So there's a lot of work on that that needs to, that, that is evolving and changing as we learn and have to adapt. But that's been this entire crisis. Um, right. And Six weeks as, ago, we did not have tests. Right, so right. Test everybody coming in too. Right. And we didn't have state locations where if you are testing um, and you get the results that you're COVID-19 positive, now we have a place where it's staff and staffing's been a huge issue too, where um, you know individuals can go and recover. So uh, there's been a lot been in flux on that, and so um, you know we 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 have had some challenges, but um, we really are uh, you know have Beethoven and Casper doing just tremendous work um, with our unsheltered population. Thank you, um, and, and you're doing tremendous work. I, I just want to tell you, um, I, I know the weight of the world is on your shoulders and I hear it in your voice every time I talk to you and I see you and all I want to do is hug you um, for the incredible work that you're doing. And I know that your family and your community is really proud of you. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to say to um, each of you, um, you, you know, we, we, we pulled the four of you together because you represent different parts of what so many people need in their lives, right? We need to make sure we have people who are actually on the ground, who are engaging immigrants in our communities who might not be engaged by some of the traditional organizations that are predominantly English speaking, um, that don't actually understand the cultural um, the, the cultural norms that actually make it comfortable and accessible for people. And the Brazilian Worker Center is out there making sure that people, regardless of language barriers or citizenship barriers, understand um, what their rights are, what their resources are. You're out there helping people um, legally protect their, their themselves and their families. 
you're out there making sure that they get their basic needs met like food and milk. And while they may not be asking you for that, you're also checking in to make sure that that is being met. And you're also raising red flags to say we're not doing enough to protect immigrants in our communities who are still being forced into really long lines waiting for basic needs to be met or having to get on buses to get to work. And so we need to make sure that we're supporting the work that you're doing in a way that some of our um, traditional organizations or state services can't um, or, or won't or are unable to. So for anyone who is watching this, um, I wanna make sure that they know more about what you're doing and that it is a statewide organization and um, just to know that there's a lot of gratitude, but gratitude's not enough. So we need to step up and, and really make sure that we connect with what you need. And that's a financial contribution, as well as some of the donations that you mentioned. So Dr. Tracy, I can't thank you enough. And we, we, you and I have a lot more work to do together. So it doesn't end at four o'clock here, or five o'clock, I should say. Is there anything that you would wanna say in the next 60 seconds to make sure people hear um, from your point of view and, and, and who you're working with? I just want to right now just say that I'm very grateful for all the support that our community um, are having coming from everywhere. Uh, the Boston Resiliency Fund, the mayor's office, Mel, uh, you know, our mayor being wonderful and all the volunteers and everyone who cares because that's what we need right now. We need to care for one another. That's how we're going to get out of this. So it's no longer about individualism, but it's about collective effort. So I'm grateful for and appreciate being in this role as well, where the community trusts us and are coming to us for support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tracy. Um, and then uh, I think Sasha had to jump off, so I wasn't able to get to her, but I know that Food for Free really has been a lifeline for so many people in our community. It was a lifeline for me growing up and my family. It's been a lifeline for many people in our community and um, anything we can do to continue supporting them so that they can continue actually accessing the food, purchasing food and getting it to people. And as we see their role continues to evolve about they will also be a hub for other things, whether they're partnering with Cradles to Crayons or partnering to get PPE out to families or more materials. So anything that we can do to continue supporting food for free um, is really important and, um, and the work that they're doing to support some of the other um, food pantries in our community. Uh, Lynn, you, you know Cradles to Crayon has always been an organization that I have been extraordinarily extraordinarily grateful for talking about our, our hierarchy of needs, um, clothing and security, which is I think one of the things people associate cradles to crayons most with has been you have been reaching out to people in ways that um, often people don't talk about. There's been an extraordinary shame about not having the right the right clothes, enough clothes, clothes that fit your children, shoes that fit your children. And people are often, it's one of the last things that they actually feel like they can ask for help. And your organization has been out there front and bold to say, it is really important that um, on any given day that a child feel comfortable and confident in what they wear and, and who they are in the world. You have pivoted to figure out how do we, how do we respond to that ongoing need because children are growing even through a pandemic and changing seasons, but also partnering um, with more organizations to make sure that we're getting additional basic needs met from, from diapers, which is always to be, to be clear, a diaper shortage. There's those bills before the legislature to try to address what diaper insecurity means for families. Um, no family should have to struggle about whether or not they eat or put a diaper on their child, but they, but thousands do every day. And so please tell us more about what we can do to support Cradles to Crayon, knowing that you are in communities throughout Massachusetts, in Cambridge, but not just Cambridge. Um, and what are, what are the most effective ways to support you and to say an incredible thank you to your staff as well. Oh, thank you. Um, so right now, the most, uh, I think, concrete way to support our organization is to support our Emergency Essentials Fund. We are able to leverage our buying power across our location here in Boston and Chicago and Philadelphia. So we're able to buy diapers for a lot less than um, one can by going to a grocery store and uh, and purchasing them. So we would greatly appreciate continued support. We've already seen some terrific support from Cambridge residents, the Cambridge Community Trust, Life Science Cares, and, uh, and other organizations and individuals. So thank you so much for promoting um, the need here. Um, and we know that people are spending a lot of time 
um, looking at their closets and in their drawers and seeing things perhaps that their kids have outgrown or maybe never have worn. Um, we would love for you to look on our website and see some um, activities you can do to package up those clothing um, uh, items into matched outfits, but we want you to hold on to them. We are not in a position to be able to accept those clothing donations right now. We're working on um, you know, what we might be able to do in the future, but you could do us a big favor by checking out our website um, and figuring out what our the tops and the bottoms that are really high quality that you would feel good for your own child to wear and um, and put those to the side for us and we'll let you know when we're ready to take them because we will desperately need them. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you to everybody there working with you and, and thank you to everybody who's supporting Cradles to Crayon. Um, Madam Mayor, before I wrap this up, is there anything else that you'd like to say to the community about supporting the Mayor's Relief Fund and, and just as the yeah. mayor? Sure, I wanna, before I, I didn't mention this earlier, but I do wanna thank um, Creative for Crayon and Lynn for um, the diapers, the hygiene uh, kits and the wipes that uh, you've donated to the city. Uh, we have families who uh, contact their liaisons uh, who enter this information into a remote spreadsheet. Uh, and then the diapers are packed on uh, Friday by volunteers and that's mostly our school staff and our teachers and our family liaisons and community members who come in um, and we've been able to get about um, 30 uh, to deliver diapers to about 20 to 30 residents per week and we're going to be doing more so um, in that work uh, you know I want to thank you uh, and your organization I want to thank um, the vice mayor uh, Alana Mallon who really is a partner in everything I do I couldn't do this work without her um, and my team. So I wanna thank um, all of them uh, because it is really uh, all hands on deck and a team effort. So I wanna get that out of the way and then uh, really just thank everyone who's donated to the fund. Uh, you know, every um, every application that's uh, we that's reviewed, um, every check that's cut, uh, you know, there's a lot of thought Put into put put into that, uh, and we are really really trying to help as many people as possible. So, uh, just thank you to everyone for supporting. Thank you, thank you for all the work that each of you are doing. I want to say thank you to everybody who was able to tune in and watch us um, and, and be part of this conversation, contribute to this conversation. Uh, I, and again, just to say to everybody that this is hard. There, there's no way around this. The patience that is being required of us as individuals and collectively to stay home, to not venture far from your home. And if you have to leave your home, it's for like some fresh air and um, not an adventure. It's fresh air. It's a little bit of exercise. It's essentials that you might need from the market or for, for medicine. And the, the more patient we can be with each other, um, the better our chances of moving through this. When we, um, if, if we continue to lose patience with this process, it's just going to prolong it. And, um, and just to say, um, my, my heart is filled with gratitude for, for all of you um, who are doing this. And um, for those of you who are taking care of loved ones at home, whether that's aging parents or children, um, you know, if you need help, please reach out. There is help. We're going to have more information up tonight on my, my email, my website. If you um, have not been getting our nightly emails, please do sign up every night. We try to provide you. Um, we don't overwhelm you. We try to provide you with enough information about what's happening at the city and at the state level. And if you find that you have an unmet need, an unmet need, please reach out to my office. Um, uh, I, we don't care where you live in Massachusetts. We'll connect you either with your state rep if we need to. And if we can help you quickly, um, we, we do that. Um, this is not easy, um, but, I, but the, the, the silver lining, because we have to find silver linings in these moments of pain, is that um, what was once thought of as um, the responsibility of charity or, or nonprofits or a mutual aid society has become quickly clear that business as usual isn't working for us. And it's actually slowed our ability to quickly respond to um, contain this virus and, and to keep each other safe. And so I do think about the changes and the levers that are being pulled to reimagine what society needs to be like, so that in fact, when we recognize that our, um, our, our very survival 
is really dependent. It's interdependent on each other's survival. And so um, prior to this pandemic, for some of us, um, it might have been easier to think about just being focused on who you are in the world and your own family or your own community. Our survival and our ability to care for each other is actually our strongest, um, it's our strongest tool to moving through this and, and surviving this. So um, I, I think there's gonna be a lot of learning that we have done as we come through this pandemic. And it's not to say that it's been worth the pain and the suffering and the loss that so many people in our community are experiencing today and will continue to experience tomorrow. But with each of you, um, I am just so much more hopeful that you are you are leaning in to your communities and to the state and, and really showing for us um, and modeling for us what we need to do to care for one another. So I wanna thank you all for, for being here and for the work you do. And um, I wanna thank CCTV who continues to be an incredible partner. One of the most important things for people right now is information. It's no good to have resources if people don't know how to access those resources. And CCTV has always known that this has been a really important um, a component of building community is being able to communicate with each other. So to the team at CCTV, thank you so much. To my team who's been working on this, um, I, I gotta tell you, I've got incredible staff as well who've been really making it short possible for me to do this work. And um, we will talk to many of you outside of town hall. And I, I just thank you again, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks.